Welcome to the Money to the Masses podcast, putting you in control of your finances. One mic, two idiots, and according to our latest figures, three listeners. Here are your hosts, Damian Fay and Andy Leakes. Before we start, Andy, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to our podcast sponsors, Money Farm. Now, Money Farm are the largest digital wealth manager in Europe, and they create portfolios of ETS for their clients. They're incredibly cheap and ideal for somebody who's wanting to get into investing and perhaps for more experienced investors who don't actually want to run their own money anymore. Now, they will even offer to run the first £20,000 of any of our listeners' portfolio absolutely free if they enter the code MTTM20K into the website at moneyfarm.com. For more information, check out their website. But for now, Andy, let's get back on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 140 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm really good, Andy. It's uh, really good to be back, actually. I missed not speaking to you last week because obviously I had a week off and uh, I'd mentioned it in advance, didn't I? But I... Uh, I went away to Barcelona for for a few days with my my lovely wife to celebrate a a big birthday. So um, yeah, it's good to be back, and I, I miss not doing the podcast. You were really careful to make sure that you let the listeners know that someone was house sitting, so not to <laughs> burgle you. <laughs> yeah, the good news is I returned, and my children were still in the house with my my parents. They weren't on they weren't on their own, and uh, yeah, all my belongings were still here. So. Yeah, it was, it was really good to go away. And actually, one of the pieces today has got a, a bit of a holiday theme. It's just um, something that's topical, but something that uh, I encounter and everyone encounters when they go away. So um, that will be interesting to do when you pay things. But uh, just before we, we, we move on to the money stuff, uh, I just thought I'd mention that we had our best ever day for podcast downloads uh, this week, despite the fact we didn't do a show, which I, which I think is quite incredible. We we managed to get about, well, it was, it was 18,000 downloads in a single day, which is our biggest ever 24 hours of downloads, which is uh, a, a big pat on the back there, Andy. I mean, we didn't do anything, actually. We, were, we weren't even here. So um, I don't know if that's... <laughs> if that's um... <laughs> A bit of something we should uh, continue to do, take a break and uh, our, our downloads will go up. But it's good to see people leaving reviews, it helps. And I think there's those sorts of things that drive it. I think somebody obviously was uh, put a bit of a spotlight on us, which is always nice. And so please share the podcast, tell people about it and uh, do write in and engage with us. Because funnily enough, two of the pieces this week, the other two pieces are direct results of questions that podcast listeners have sent in which I will read out, which are very relevant and um, topical again. It's probably a good time to remind people, it looks like we've got lots and lots of new listeners this week, so welcome to you. And it's a good time to remind you that Damien does answer every single question that comes his way. So do get your questions into him. Let's put the address out there early doors so you can get to hold of Damien. Damien at moneytothemasses.com or you can contact just the podcast address. It's podcast at moneytothemasses.com or of course Twitter is always a good way to get in touch and that's at moneytothemasses and use the number two and you can get straight through to Damien with any of your sort of money related questions and we may even feature it on the podcast. So you say Damien we've got two this week from listeners. Should we go, should we go straight into it? Yeah we'll go, we'll go straight into it and for people who are new to the podcast what we do we tend to do three pieces every every week and we try not to date them in any way. We try to make it evergreen so people go back and download our back catalogue because, therefore, it's uh, relevant whenever you listen. Now, the, the first one I'm going to pick up is something that actually impacts me. Now, I got a, a question. I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. It was from Nadia who wrote in, and she, she actually wrote, Thanks eternally for your Money to the Masses content, all of which manages to be both outstanding and funny. I'm not sure about the funny bit, Andy. I think that's you. Uh, she's referring to but they want she asked the question and it said that she'd heard or read that the earliest age at which an individual may access their private pension may move from uh, 55 up to 57 uh, she notes that this was a legislative proposal a few years ago but it quietly disappeared but rather than being actively shelved it just sort of disappeared into the background so do i have any intelligence on what is going on and whether it's likely to be revived now it's an interesting one, actually, because it links in very nicely to something that happened to the state pension age. Now, 
George Osborne, a year or so ago, decided, well, the pension freedoms came in a bit before that, but, but when he brought in the pension freedoms, when everyone could actually start cashing in their pensions, they obviously had an age at which you could do that, and he decided that he was going to pitch that age at 10 years below the state retirement age, so the age at which you get your state pension. So that age is 65, and he decided, right, we're going to put the age at which you could access your pension and your own personal private one, the one that you put money in personally, not the state one, at 55. And that kind of 10-year differential was going to be kept. Now, of course, George Osborne is no longer the Chancellor, and lots of things have changed. And if you recall, when we had the general election, there were lots of things that were being brought in as part of the finance bill and from the previous budget that were canned. Do you remember we had a, we had a show, we talked about them. And one of them, for example, was the uh, reduction in the uh, dividend allowance, the amount of money you could have in dividends before you had to pay tax. Now, just an FYI that that has actually been brought back now. They are going to cut that dividend allowance. So go back and listen to that podcast if you have any income from dividends at all or you own your own business and pay yourself in dividends. But all those things they actually got rid of, they're now bringing them back now that Theresa May has just about managed to get her feet back under the desk at number 10. So what happened is that the idea of them having this 10-year differential between uh, when you can take your own personal pension and the state pension, they were going to keep that in lockstep. And previously, it had been planned that the state pension age was going to to start slowly creeping up because we're all living longer and it means that the amount of money we need to pay for state pensions is going to grow ever more because don't forget there's something really important about the state pension and about the national insurance contributions you pay there is no pot with Damien Fay written on it for my state pension it doesn't exist it's a very much a kind of hand-to-mouth existence what happens the national insurance that you and I pay Andy are paying for today's pensioners there is no pot with Andy Leakes on it so when you get to state pension age you can't sit there and say well I've been paying national insurance for 40 years where's my pension well you've got to rely on the fact that there are people paying national insurance when you go there and that what whatever the rules are at that point, whether there is even a state pension, which I'll come on to a little bit later. So what it means is that if there are going to be fewer people paying national insurance, because you don't pay national insurance when you get to state re- uh, retirement age, then they're going to have to do something. Either they reduce the state pension, which isn't going to be popular. So what they're doing is making us have to work longer. Now, this is a theme that you're going to have to get used to. It's bad news if you think you're going to want to retire early, that you're going to have to work longer. That is the message that's coming from the state. So what happened is that they were going to increase the state pension age from 65 up to 67 by 2028, which meant, therefore, that the age which you could access your personal pension is going to increase from 55 towards 57. But it was only, it wasn't actually written in law, and so it seemed to disappear, as Nadia said. But there have been noises from the Treasury that that is actually still going to be the case. It's going to be enshrined and it's going to actually become law at some point. But something very interesting happened in about a week or so ago. that the They dropped a bombshell when it came to the state pension. So people, anybody aged between about 39 and 45, which basically is me, I includes me in that bracket, were told their state pension age is no longer going to be 67 as I, as it was uh, going to be previously. Overnight, they're saying that, yeah, it's going to be 68 now. So I'm going to have to wait a year longer to get my state pension when I eventually get there. Now, that's going to cost people typically about £10,000 in state pension, which obviously is, is a fair amount of money. Now, lots of people are disgruntled about this. I mean, yeah, like I say, it, it impacts me. And if you're aged between... 39 and probably 45 that change is staggered but you can pretty much be rest assured if you're younger than 40 you're going to have a state a state pension age of 68 now they were always going to make, raise it to 68 but they were going to do it later so i wasn't going to be impacted it was going to be people who were a bit younger than me but they brought it forward now the key thing you got to bear in mind what we're talking about here is for retirement planning this is what this is all about You've got to get used to the idea that even though the uh, ages are 55 at the moment, which you can get your own uh, access, your own personal pension, and 65 for state pension, so it's 55 for personal pension, 65 for state pension, that is going to go up. And future governments are going to keep pushing that up because at the moment they're in, they're in lockstep. 
but there's no there's no way they're going to not raise that 55 to even higher than 58 because if you think about it if they're going to keep raising the state pension age which they will do there's no there's no way they won't because our life expectancies are increasing and we, we've still got this problem that we're very much hand-to-mouth existence when it comes to the state pension it means therefore that people are going to have to rely more on their own pensions now if you're able to access your pension at a whim and cash it in that means that you're going to have to um, you're not going to have a pension perhaps to sort of help you that gap until you get your state pension which would therefore mean that you would end up start claiming some form of benefits from the government which is going to be obviously not what they want so the rule of thumb here that everybody's got to bear in mind is that despite the rules being fairly generous now and the age has been quite low they're going to be ratcheted up and so you're going to put money into a pension but you've got to get used to the idea that you might not be able to get it at 55 it could be at some point higher than 60 now the other thing i want people to really think about carefully why i'm so not blasé about the fact that i've just lost a year state pension it's going to keep happening but i've never ever planned to get a state pension it's not that i can afford to not get one i can't i mean like anybody i've got two children and, and uh, trying to keep a roof over their heads and everything so it's a struggle for me just like it's everybody else to try and even think about saving for your pension it's not something i'm able to do to the level that i'd love to that's just the reality now what's going to probably happen is that i realize that the state pension is probably going to end up means tested or not exist by the time i get to uh, state pension age so therefore i don't even plan to receive it so everybody should be doing that if you get it it's a brucey bonus if i get there and there is a some form of state pension i'm going to take it as a bonus so therefore you need to plan and plan that you're not going to get that eight thousand odd pounds a year from a state pension now how you do that is that there's first you could go and use a calculator that I built that's on money to the masses very slick I have to say if you go to calculators dot money to the masses dot com forward slash pension so calculators dot money to the masses dot com forward slash pensions do that on your mobile it works brilliantly on mobiles what it does is it will tell you everything about how much you're going to get if you retire or whenever you choose to retire so basically you can plan so you it, you can put in how much you have in a pension even if you don't have anything in there what age you'd like to retire how much you earn now how much you um would like to put into a pension and then you can it will tell you what sort of pension you can expect but then you can vary the scenarios to well what happens how much pension income will i get if i retire later or pay a bit more in so it was deliberately a simple tool to, to use we made it simple but it does a hell of a lot so go and use that the other thing to do if you're a bit confused of when you're going to retire and get your state pension then go to .gov.uk website forward slash state hyphen pension hyphen age and you can check what your pension age will be they've already updated the calculator it's like a tool you put your date of birth your sex and then it will tell you when you can um, what age you're going to retire at so the last thing i'm going to mention before we move on to the next topic is for people like me I said that £10,000 that's kind of cost me that I've lost because of the state pension age moving up a year and that's you can you could take that number roughly and if every time the state pension age moves up which it will do in future that's the sort of level you can think that you're going to lose out on now if for somebody like me I wanted to counter that with my own personal planning then for somebody who's in their early 40s who are going to be impacted by this change, they'd need to put about £21 a month into some form of investment that will grow at, say, 5 to 7% a year, just as an, a, an average, that would actually re therefore replace that £10,000 they're going to miss by the time they get to state pension. So hopefully I've explained that all perfectly well there, Andy. But in answer to Nadia's question, is it is going to go up. It looks like it's going to go up, as they previously said, but I think it's going to be a hell of a lot worse. Good. And while you've been talking, I've actually gone on to calculators.moneytothemasses.com forward slash pension, and I've got my results. I won't share them because actually I'm going to cry into my uh, I'm going to cry into my cornflakes in the morning when I consider how uh, how short I am. Uh, but no, really, really good, really interesting. So do make sure you do that. It's uh, it's well for most people it'll be eye opening. For me, it's eye watering. But uh, <laughs> thanks for that. But the thing is, though, on that and you before I quickly move on, the aim of the tool was um, not to be problem focused because what tends to happen is 
in the world of finance, they try and frighten people and go, oh, you, you're never going to retire, you're going to work till you die. And the aim of the tool was to show people with simple tweaks by just moving their retirement age by a year or two or by um, just adding an extra sort of 10, 20 pounds a month, they could see the impact and it would actually very quickly bring down the amount they need to save and actually increase the amount they get in, in, in retirement. On that note, go back and listen to a podcast. So you go and search through our historical back catalogue. There is one where I explain how you can retire on the national average wage of about 25 grand, I think with about, I think it was about 80, 80 pound a month or something like that it was. But go back and look and it explains exactly how to use that tool to be able to work backwards that you can reduce the amount you have to save. Right, on to the next thing. I will do a slightly more easy listening one here, Andy, on the holiday front. It's quite a short, punchy one. But when I went away on holiday, one of the things that struck me is that when you go to a hotel, shop or whatever, that we can pay by card now much more easily than we ever used to. I mean, I I haven't been on holiday for a few years and it's almost comical. I was going to the airport and, you know, with the new scanners with passports and that, I was like a kid. I was like, oh, my God, what's going on when you go in and put your passport and they scan your face and all that kind of thing that they do now it's so different to when i went on holiday two years ago i think i was holding everybody up but now you can even start using your uh, you can use your cards everywhere is the point i'm getting at and one of the things that you will have a choice when you go into a restaurant or a hotel and pay for something is when you pay by card you will get a choice of whether to pay in the local currency or your own home currency so for example i was in barcelona i got the choice with paying euros or pounds now lots of people don't know which to pick and sometimes they think the best option is to pick their own currency because therefore they can see how much it is and there's no nothing dodgy going on in some weird way but the opposite is actually true and i don't know if you've ever seen it andy when you go there i don't know what, what would you usually choose sterling or would you choose in that example euros yeah, sadly, I'd uh, go against what you've just uh, advised, and I'd probably have gone for the uh, for the pound. It's been a while since I've been abroad, actually. That reminds me, I must take a break. Um, but yeah, I'd probably pick the pounds. But that's purely out of the um, the mindset where I want to see what it actually equates to in in pounds, because you're never quite sure when it's a foreign currency. Yeah. You kind of want to make that comparison back to the the pound that you're used to. But you but know. you. You are just like everybody else, and even I used to do that. And it wasn't until I found out about something called dynamic currency conversion. And now dynamic currency conversion is a very fancy title, but what it is is that when you go to a restaurant, shop, or whatever, the the seller has the option when they do the conversion back into your home currency, so in our case into pounds, they are able to apply an exchange rate of effectively they're choosing and what it means is they they can apply effectively a charge of up to six percent onto the transaction so your rate will be effectively six percent worse off so if you went round on your holiday and you kept paying in pounds on every time you used your card they, you effectively would pay six percent more uh, than anybody else for everything which is quite a lot so the advice is if you get that choice then it nearly always it's better to uh, choose the local currency and for me i just always focus on that idea of when in rome and if you that phrase if you ever get there and you think oh what am i supposed to do it's that yeah when in rome do as the romans do it's it's you pick what the locals are doing and that way you won't get stung by dynamic currency conversion and the reason i say it's topical because when i came back and picked up a a, a newspaper there was a massive article about uh, dynamic currency conversion in the in the national press which is very unusual so um, you may have seen something about it and wonder what what the hoo-ha was about and um, well that's it so make sure you pick the local currency so that's the end of that piece Andy before we move on Andy I just wanted to quickly mention 8020 investor now 8020 investor is my DIY investment service do go and check it out. I empower and teach people how to invest their own money. The service provides data-driven fund tables. The data is driven by my own unique 8020 investor algorithm, which I created. You also get stop loss alerts, you get research articles and insights, you get market commentaries, monthly commentaries, and DIY investment lessons, but you also get access to my 50,000 pound portfolio, which is a portfolio of my own money, which I run live on the site for members to see and it shows people how I use the service to 
uh, maximise my returns. And in the first two years of doing so, I turned £50,000 into £59,500, which is a 19% a return, beating investment managers, professional fund managers, financial advisors, investment banks, passive trackers in the market. So everybody can have a free 30-day trial of 8020 Investor. And you can claim that by going to moneytothemasses.com and going and clicking on the 8020 Investor hyperlink at the top of the page. So go and try the service. Let me know what you think of it. And I, I know from the feedback that you're going to love it. But for now, on with the show. Good, so you mentioned that this week we're going to be covering a couple of listener questions. We've done one, I'm presuming we're going to be doing another one now. Yeah, there, there was a question from Andy. Great name. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as, yes. I, as I said Andy, Andy just, for some reason, punched the air. I obviously... <laughs> 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 why is it that whenever have you ever noticed whenever you're out somewhere and some uh, like you're amongst lots of people and your hometown gets mentioned you always sort of go yay <laughs> i don't know why that happens all the time i do know the other one i do in and i should grow up i really should but you know again it's like that holiday thing i you know when you go and you're in somewhere where you're eating of course there's loads someone of people drops a plate and someone drops a plate and it smashes I, I've just got this. Wee. I've got this childishness that just creeps out. It just it just springs out and uh, wee, yeah. I, I, I blame my I blame my dad. He's he's nearly seventy and he still does it. I think it's his fault and I think I've just inherited the the wee. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Frank Skinner once said? He said I knew I was in a posh restaurant the other night because the waiter dropped a plate and not a word. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you know you're in a posh place. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, I obviously never in a, in a posh place. I think I'd even not even be able to stop myself if I was in a posh place. I'd probably just sort of almost into the napkin go. <laughs> you get escorted out. You really would. Back to uh, the the other Andy. Back to Andy's question. What Andy did? He, we were discussing something on email, and he asked uh, that he'd recently become a father. And with the cost of education and etc, etc, children are expensive beings, after all. Um, he'd like to start saving for his child's future and I wonder what the best options are. Now, he was saying that he planned to regularly save and top up any gifts from grandparents, etc. And, and, and he, he mentions junior ices and he said that he wasn't sure about his son having unrestricted access to them once he turns 18. And... Do you know what? That's right on cue. I, I actually meant to mention this at the beginning of the podcast, but I'm actually I'm at home alone tonight. I'm not technically alone. My two children <laughs> are in bed. It's late <laughs> on a Friday night, and I've got the baby monitor with me, and I think it just triggered, and I think she just cried. So if, I, if you heard that, I've now just... Has she gone back to sleep? This is Sophia, by the way, who, who once featured on the podcast when she was about four months old and breathed down the mic. Yeah, I think she's all right. Phew. Right. New age parenting. There, there you go, see? How, how Brit, she obviously heard about it. She probably was, Dad, are you doing anything for me up there in terms of saving for my future? <laughs> Go back to sleep. <laughs> anyway, Andy mentions a really good point about junior ices. Now, junior ices are, work very much the same way as normal ices, that they are tax-free vehicles. You put money in, you can get cash ones, or you can get ones where you invest stocks and shares, junior ices. And you put money in and there's no tax on the income or the capital gains. Now, there are sort of rules around the limits you can put in each year and the problem with them it's not such a problem but they your your child does get unrestricted access to them now i would love to think that my two daughters are going to turn into wonderful human beings but i do realize that i am their father and so therefore there's always the outside chance that they might not uh, turn out the way i'd like them to and of course i don't think there's anything wrong with the fact i wouldn't necessarily want them to have access to money when they are 18 so, because don't forget, when I was 18, I was completely um, irresponsible and would have blown it on booze and whatever. And I, I don't think 18-year-olds these days are any different. And, of course, they can do what they like with the money once they uh, turn 18 with junior ISIS. So, I just wanted to focus on that part of Andy's question, because there's lots of things you can do and ways you can invest for children. If you want to see all the options, go on moneytothemasses.com and actually search in the search bar at the top, uh, investing for children, and you'll see all the options. But, for Andy... Um, one of the things that I would generally suggest, there are things you can do with trusts. You can make investments and place them in trust if you want, discretionary trust, etc. It's a bit more, it's a bit convoluted and a little bit complicated. But the 
easiest way I think to do this is I would personally I would use my own ISA allowance if I was saving for my children that wasn't a, a bank account if there's something I wanted to put some serious money away and didn't want them to have access to and it was from me I would put it in my own ISA and earmark it for them in the future and so that way I've maintained control but I still benefit from the tax-free status that an ISA enjoys and when they get to 18 then I can actually give it to them. Now of course there are inheritance tax issues etc the fact that you are technically giving them a big gift when they are 18 and you, while you won't pay tax immediately on that there is a potential if you were to die you could do blah 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 but for me, I think it's the simplest method that I would use. The other thing to note is that you get a £20,000 allowance on ISAs now. It's, it's actually really rocketed up. So if you're a husband and wife, that means you can put £40,000 a year into ISAs. Now, that's a lot. I'm not sure many people ever would do that. Um, so I'm sure that you wouldn't use your own allowance and not have anything spare for your children. So what I would suggest is, uh, personally... I would use a junior ice. Uh, sorry, I would use a normal stocks and shares ice using my allowance because it's simple, and you can always then take it out of that in the future if you want to and put it into something else. You will lose the ISA allowance and tax wrapper around that. Bear that in mind. But also, I have a um, children's savings account for those gifts from grandparents, etc. Because obviously, they aren't going to want to give you money and put it that you put in your own name in case you again go and spend it. Um, after all, you are their irresponsible child once upon a time, so they, <laughs> so they know how this works. So that's what I do. If, if grandparents want to do that, I have a savings account that is in their name. And if you want to see the best ones, then again, go on to moneytothemasses.com and there's a, a compare tab and we have savings tabs on there and they're updated regularly with the best rates for children's accounts. And they're great because then the child does obviously gain access to that in in the future, but quite rightly so they should if the grandparents are contributing but if the grandparents are contributing anyway then they may want to put it into a junior ISA of some kind if it's a cash one or an investment one but if it's your own money I don't think there's anything too wrong with putting it in a, in a stocks and shares ISA it's not the perfect solution but if you want to maintain control it's the easiest one that I it's the easiest one so I, I think that's it Andy I think I've um, pretty much covered everything uh, on that one and also I'll just chuck on the end of that piece don't forget everyone has a thousand pounds um, savings allowance these days where you don't pay income on the first thousand pounds of interest that you earn so again that's another way you gain in keeping control but not using your ISO allowance so that's it Andy we're done for another week I think that's it we've, we've kept it to under 30 minutes and we crammed a lot in there as we ever do but it was I enjoyed it it was good and um, for listeners that's pretty much it for this week but uh, i know you've got more work to do to let the listeners behind the curtain there it's gone 10 o'clock now on a friday night and damien's got at least another hour or so ahead of him <laughs> plus uh, any daddy duties in case daughters wake up yeah i'm not asking for sympathy i i my estimate is what i'm gonna do i'm doing some 80 20 investor stuff you will have heard a a clip about 80 20 investor during this podcast and um yeah I, i'm doing some commentary for the for the weekly newsletter that it probably mean i'll be up until about one o'clock but that hey ho that that such is such as such is the life of how we roll our money to the masses but uh, yeah so um do get in touch 80 20 investor I, I, I will just mention this i did uh reviewed my portfolio uh again just this last week and uh i'm really pleased about how it's um it's going and it's up about 22.5% in just over two years. That's profit and uh, just over two years outstripping professional fund managers and the market and trackers, uh, passive. So I'm really pleased with that and I've been getting some good emails from people because do you know what Andy, it's funny, one of the things that I love what I do, it's really, I really do, but some people, you know when you have a job and you stay awake at night and you think about things and you try and create a job that you don't do that um inadvertently doing what i do you i, I kind of created a scenario where i'm back to doing <laughs> doing that occasionally so um because it personally matters to me because i know there are people who follow 80 20 best and love it and I, and I love the fact that they enjoy it and, and they make money and uh but there is a responsibility to that which i love so yeah that's why i sit up to one o'clock on a friday 
Good. I enjoyed it. I really do. Please do leave a review if you've enjoyed this podcast. Even if you haven't enjoyed it, just leave five stars. It really helps (laughs) us to go up those charts. And uh, thanks again to the new listeners. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Plan. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.